morning. Good morning. Happy Mother's Day. Okay. Sun is already up. All right. I'm gonna slip downstairs, and we'll be back shortly. Hello, Charlie. Ever. Just trust us, Gloria's cute today. You'll see her eventually, most likely. There's Dan. Last year, they issued six books. But, uh, to your wife, Carol, you're going to be one. To your wife, Carol, you're going to be one. Mother, 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 you're going to be one. Mother,
All right, take your hymn book and turn to 236 Amazing Grace. 236 Amazing Grace. Song not brand new to most of you. Amazing Grace.
Amen. Love that song. A whole lot of people sing it and don't understand what it means. But it's a great song, especially if you understand what it means. All right. Cheapskates would never bring it in anyway. <laughs> Happy birthday, Israel, tomorrow. Yay. 70 years. Yay. We'll just pray that Iran doesn't try to blow it up. And uh, we've changed practice for the band to the 26th. Martha's social schedule is so difficult to work around. She's <laughs> always doing something. So 26th is open, so we moved it there. And it worked out good. If anybody, you you guys have plenty of people and all that. We were we would have passed them. What about the truck? Is that something you are Too using? Too many trucks. Truck? Yeah. My brother's yeah. supplying them. Man, that's that's great. Yeah. And labor. Memorial Day yeah, is Monday the twenty eighth, and I'm telling you that just because it's for most of you a day off and makes you happy. Yeah. Uh, then we have our next Feast of Charity on June 3rd. We have Pizza Night on June 6th. And then we're going to have a birthday cake June 10th for the June birthdays. One of us here are turning 25 years old on the 12th. Speaking of the Kentucky Derby. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. We are going Maybe to give... Maybelle. Okay, Martha. <laughs> <laughs> She's bad as Jenny. I mean, we're driving down the road. All I have to do is say the first two words of any song. She should be on that show and name that too. she not only name it, she'll sing the whole thing. Amen. Jenny and Martha. We have a DVD. God of Wonders. It's a great uh, uh, DVD uh, subtitled Exploring the Wonders of Creation, oh, cool. well, I think Conscience, and the Glory of God. And make sure every family gets one. That means like one for them and one for them and not for everybody. And uh, oh, uh, back there is going to go home with what, three DVDs now? <laughs> Uh, it's got his week booked. But uh, it comes in English, and you can choose other languages if you have friends that are Arabic, Farsi, French, Hindi, Mandarin, Punjabi, or Spanish. Is it described? It is. Uh, it's one of those where I don't think it's described, but there's. it's mostly narration. So I don't know. Uh, it's been a while since I saw it, actually. I'm going to have to watch it with you to see. There's also subtitle languages. A uh, bunch of them. I'm not going to name them all, but like Dutch and Russian and all kinds. Cool. So check that out on the front cover there. If you have any friends or family that aren't English first, but maybe they're, that's their second language, maybe something you can invite them over and uh, pop some popcorn and enjoy that. Thank you. So we'll have a couple extra copies and put them over here later. Ooh, Gloria's got a new movie. Ooh. All right, before we... Uh, have our study and honey give me a second oh, hey, Tina. this is a song that is very similar to the title actually of today's study this was written by jenny and she's going to perform it
Christian woman who happens to be a jukebox. Woohoo! All right. In Colossians 1, 3 to 5, do you want to turn there? Colossians chapter 1, verses 3 to 5, and similar to her uh, song title, Faith, Love, and Hope. And you'll see the reason we titled it that way is because that's the way it is in the text. In that order, beginning in verse 3. In our first study, we were introduced to Paul, which no stranger to most of us, and then uh, Timothy, and we discussed the city of Colossae, and that's where we left off. So beginning verse 3, if you're there, go ahead and read with me verses 3 through 5. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have to all the saints. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. All right, let's pray. Father, we are so thankful for uh, this time in your word and for Jesus. And as we will see, this truth of the gospel and the faith, love, and hope that we have received from you that it is all of grace and you alone deserve the glory and you alone are the reason we understand anything we read in this book it's not a book of the intellect it's a book of the spirit and by your spirit we are given understanding and we ask for that this morning in jesus name amen amen, amen. amen. all right there uh, verse three begins we give thanks we give thanks, and so we ought to give thanks. Amen? Amen. <laughs> and by now, we should take note of how Paul demonstrates such thankfulness to the Lord for his goodness. In every letter Paul writes, there's space given to being thankful. And in this generation, <laughs> you will stick out like a sore thumb if you're thankful. If you're grateful, uh, look at the kids these days. They have a, they are being raised with a sense of entitlement, mm -hmm. and but that's actually uh, their nature. I can tell you from the very earliest moments that Mariah came into this world nearly 25 years ago, um, she had a sense of entitlement. It uh, started with she could only talk even, and she was saying, "Mine." <laughs> Even when it wasn't hers. Mine. Uh, Gloria. I just get ready to say, Gloria is a chip off the old block. <laughs> what I, and what Gloria is nicer about it, though, she'll walk up and grab a hold of something one of the other kids has, and she says, please. Aww. It's looking at, like, you're going to give that to me, please. <laughs> you don't have to teach that. That's why uh, to find a non-Christian who is truly thankful is a rare thing. Because thankfulness isn't something that comes naturally. It's something that has to be uh, taught. And it can be taught by parents to children, but as adults, you'll see that kind of wane unless they have the Spirit of God in them, making them thankful. And uh, that's in contrast to our own age. Paul, very thankful, always giving thanks. We're in the last days. Amen. Well, then when you see it, verse 1 says, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Then look around, because we're in the last days. Perilous times have come. Uh, men shall be lovers of their own selves. That's just not a statement of fact. You just go to the bookstore. 
Go to the magazine rack. The magazines and books are all about telling you to love yourself. Self magazine. <laughs> for, for, for heaven's sake. I mean, how, you can't get much clearer than that. Uh, you know, the, that's why I'm so shocked right now with what we're going, uh, we're sitting under, you know, the Trump presidency and everything. And I've thought about it and some of what his message is may appeal to this self. And so some of the people who voted for him, I think, might have been drawn by that. But, man, I mean, the previous president we had eight years was a narcissistic, self-absorbed oh, yeah. egomaniac. Yes. And so I thought, well, after Obama, what are we going to get? And I thought, well, we're probably going to get Hillary. And the fact that we didn't get Hillary, I'm, just, I'm still in shock. And uh, I... I I still look at the, I'm like, well, is there a sea change going on? You go into the bookstore, it's still all about me. Still all about self. It's only by the grace of God that we're getting a little bit of a reprieve from the socialism and the sodomy that Barack Obama gave to this country. I'm hoping it'll be a long time before our White House is lit up to be a fact flag. But that's what Obama gave us. And uh, we're living in that age. Right now, uh, there are preachers being removed, but there's also just people who leave churches and never come back because that preacher has the audacity to preach the truth. Why? Because this generation doesn't want to hear the truth. Tell me what I want to hear. Tell me what I'm seeing on TV and being programmed to believe by the television. Tell me that it's okay to be gay. It's not okay to be gay. Amen. Tell me it's okay to fornicate, shack up. It's not okay. Amen. Tell me it's okay to blaspheme. Tell me it's okay to kill my baby. It's not okay. Amen. But most churches, they don't maybe, a lot of them won't preach in support of that stuff, but they just won't mention it. They won't say anything about it. Why? Because they're looking at a bunch of self-loving fools. And they don't want to offend the fools because then the pews will empty out and the offerings will go down and we can't have that because then I won't be able to buy my boat and have my vacation. Yeah. <gasps> That's the motivation behind a lot of preachers today behind this pulpit in other churches. Not in this one. <laughs> but in a pulpit just like this in other churches, they're motivated by the pragmatism of making sure they keep the pews full and keep the coffers full. So their bank account is full. Well, I'm here to tell you that I don't care if the only person in the room was Jenny and Doug or Jenny and whoever, because I know Jenny will be here. Aww. I'm pretty sure we got some people who will be here. But I'm just saying, if it emptied out and there are only two people in here, I'm not going to change this message because I'm not coming up with it. I'm preaching the Word of God. Amen. 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 Covetous, boasters, Proud. Now look at that. The Bible says if you're proud, you're a part of the end time apostasy, and yet you're told by the world to be proud. You're told every year to go down to Columbus and walk naked through the streets and be proud of being a sodomite. Proud, pride, pride, yes. No, God says you're disgusting if you're proud. Disobedient to parents. We heard from Janie, you heard it from me, you'll hear from other parents today. Who's, the kids are, I mean, there's always been that to an extent, but man, what's going on today? Mm. The rebellion. And you talk to, uh, the for the first time, I think, in American history, uh, almost a majority of this generation coming up is socialist. Oh, yeah. Why is that? Because they're rebellious. They're rebelling against... Everything that this country has been since its founding, they're rebelling against God's Word. This book is not a socialist book. Amen. This book does not uh, encourage you to establish governments that control property and control your language and control your guns and everything else. Amen. That's not God's way. Go look at under the Mosaic Law, you, you get in trouble for blaspheming. There were certain things you couldn't do, just like today we couldn't walk into a, a busy uh, theater and yell fire unless there's a fire. There were those kind of rules, 
But under Mosaic law, your property was your property. God believed in it so much that even if you tried to give it away, every jubilee you had to give, take it back. <laughs> he was all about private property and not socialism. Amen. And so forth and so on. But it continues and says, what? After disobedience to parents, what's the next word? Look at your Bible. Baby. Those children who don't love their parents. Those are men with men having sex, claiming to be married. Women with women having sex and claiming to be married. All that, unnatural, without natural affection. Truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. <clears throat> and that's just a fact. If you're a decent person today and you're not a fornicating blasphemer, etc., people can't stand you. If you won't get drunk, tell the dirty jokes, go along with the filth, you don't get invited to family gatherings a lot of times. Oh, me. <laughs> yeah, that's the generation we're in. Traitors. Heady. High-minded. Now look at that last phrase there. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. That's why you, a lot of people are in this church building this morning. Uh, um, and this isn't reflecting on anyone in particular as far as people who regularly attend here. I mean, there's people who haven't been here in weeks and months because Sunday's their day to do what they want to do. Sunday's their day. They get to sleep in. And then they get to go somewhere and do this and do that, you know. That, why? They love pleasures more than they love God. So they can't take out a couple of hours of their Sunday and a lot of people won't come to this church because they want to go to that church down the road where they can go in at 10 a.m. and be out at 1040. <laughs> There's everyone in town. Go look at it. They, they give you the list. They have one service at 9, another one at 10, another one at 11, one's contemporary, one's traditional, whatever. In and out less than 45 minutes. Catholic church. That's right. And they even have a Saturday night mass for the people who want to sleep in on Sunday. I know the guys who go out to the bars and then go to the mass half soused and go in and, you know, <laughs> and then they go out and party some more and then sleep in Sunday morning. Yeah. Lewis says in verse 5, though, read that with me. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Boy, that's a hard pill to swallow right there. Uh, that's why we don't, I'm just going to tell you straight up the truth, we don't fellowship with a, lot, with a bunch of churches around here. And I don't hang out with the preachers. Why? Because if I'm hanging around some guy who doesn't really have any faith in the Word, he likes to golf more than he does anything, he's all about making money in retirement, and he's not about the ministry, I don't want, that's not, I'm just, what I'm going to do, I'm going to do what the Bible says, I'm going to turn away. And we got churches around here. I get invitations every couple of weeks. These ministerial associations, and, and uh, I can't remember what they call the local one. <laughs> and then you go there, and they got some Hindu talking, or some Muslim talking, or so. And and they're talking about, whoa, we're all just part of one big happy family. <laughs> Not according to the Bible. The Bible says He gave power to become the sons of God, to them that believe on His name. Amen. You're not a son of God just because you're born. Amen. And so, as a Christian, we look around and we see this thankless generation and we should tell our, say to ourselves, you know what, I don't want to be like that. I want to be thankful. And I'm not just talking to, to God. Of course you should be thankful to God. You should say so. You should be thankful to anybody and everybody contributing to your life. Amen. You should be thankful for a pastor. And that means if I drop dead tomorrow and you get another pastor, it's not Greg Miller I'm talking about. I'm talking about any pastor that you sit under who has the guts to preach the truth in this damned age that we live in today. You should be thankful for that preacher. Amen. 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 I'm thankful for every single one of them, all two of them or three of them. Amen. Amen. They're hard to find. Yep. Amen. You have some guys that get up there and rail on issues and stuff, but then they're heretical doctrinally or they're using an NIV or an ESV or something. Women so it's, what? Women in pants. 
Don't get me started, woman. That's the issue of the day. You want a sign that the Antichrist is near? Look at all the women in here with pants on. That's what you get. Be thankful that I'm not that guy. There you go. You got something to be thankful for. Amen. Thank goodness. <laughs> Back to verse 3. We give thanks to who? God. First and foremost, it's to God, and it says this, and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Folks, to make God the Father and Jesus the same is absurd and heretical. You have to understand, you have a Father in heaven, and then He sent His Son, who is the eternal Son of God. He's eternally unchanged. He is God manifest in the flesh. Amen. Jesus Christ. And He sent Him to die in your place. Not just to die for you like a gesture. You deserve right now to be in a lake of fire. Do you know that? Everybody in this room, including little Gloria, the cute little babies... Why? Because we are a cursed race. Amen. You're born in sin. And by God's grace, I believe it's clear from Scripture that the little babies, until they reach a point they know right from wrong, if they perish, if they die, and that includes the aborted babies, Amen. go to be immediately with the Lord. Amen. All the Amen. preemies that die, all the stillborns, all the miscarriages, all those. But once... You become conscious of your need. But when you reach that point, the first moment that you do not repent toward God with faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ, you deserve hell. Just think of that. However long you went. I was 19 before I got saved. I believe I knew consciously what was going on by the age of nine at least. Um, I don't remember before that really having much thought about anything except for... Mine. <laughs> but after that, <laughs> I remember having, I'd sit in bed at night and kind of think about things and all that. Well, for 10 years then, we'll say a decade, God graciously and mercifully kept me alive until I got saved. Amen. So God is gracious and merciful a few billion times a day. Just by letting unsaved people live another day. Yeah. Think of that. Yeah. Programming alert. We will deal more with, closely with this later in our study of chapter 1. A whole lot more about this, about Jesus, and about the Father. We'll come back to it. So we continue where he says, praying always for you. Why? Because he's thankful. <laughs> if you don't pray for the people in this church, your church family... That just means you're really not thankful for us. I, and and I, don't, I don't have a list, and I don't get to go through a list and say, uh, Dear Lord, I pray for Mariah and Stephen and Charlie and Olivia and Jenny and Nick and Tracy and Tara and Chris. I don't, I don't get, that, that's not really praying. <laughs> but what I do, actually I envision in my mind sometimes the, what I'm seeing right now. And as I'm praying, I'll think about everybody that comes to my mind, and I'll, if I know the need... If I know something going on in their life, that's what I pray for. And if I don't, I say the obvious. Lord, I have no idea what they may need. I have no idea what's going on in their life, but you do. And I lift them up to you. And now Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to take a while. <laughs> Jimmy, can you get me some coffee? Because I'm thankful for Charlie. Yeah. That's why I pray for Charlie. Now, actually, I, I do pray for Charlie, and there's some things, you know, he has going on, but nothing like it used to be. <laughs> <laughs> nothing like it used to be. My mom says the same thing about me, Charlie. As a matter of fact, don't bring it up. She'll, she'll, <laughs> oh. and she will keep you there for a while telling you about me. Pray always for you. Now, that, that I, I, I'm not going to pretend that I'm a monk and I sit at home and you hear me, you drive past my house and you hear me in there going, Oh, Lord! You know, it's not like that. 
But praying always means that, uh, you know, you just always on my heart and in my mind as my family. And so when I think about you and I pray for you, and now trust me, my memory's not perfect. There's many times where I'm like, I know there's something I should be praying for. But I can't remember what it was. So Lord, you know. And so then I may see you next time and I'll say, you know, what was it you were asked for prayer for? Because if I lose my little sheet of paper, I'm, you know, I'm in trouble. It's like Paul trying to find his church without Google, amen? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and we all, I didn't say that. <laughs> MapQuest. MapQuest. That's who, I, I try to use them and they need to improve. But anyway, <laughs> when it comes to praying for one another, let's just admit it, we all fail at this, yes. but we should be reminded to make that better effort. Paul, I don't think Paul was perfect. Paul wasn't infallible unless he was writing one of these epistles. That's the only time he was infallible. God gave him these words to give to us. But in his life, and now I'm talking about the apostle, by the way. <laughs> but the apostle Paul was a human being. And I'm sure there were times he would wake up in the morning and think, oh, I dozed right off without praying. You know? There's times I'm sure he was listening to someone else preach and he was thinking, wonder what I'm going to have for dinner. <laughs> like, Paul, this is all in his head. You know, Stop that. You're supposed to be the apostle, Paul. Stop thinking about what you're going to eat. Why? Because he's human. But the question I think God is concerned with when it comes to you, are you making an effort? It's not, he's not expecting perfection out of any of us, but are you making an effort? That's what he's, I think that's what God's after. So now in the next two verses, we'll see Paul encourage the Colossians for their, as we titled it, faith, love, and hope. And quickly, I want to move through these just to make the points. He says in verse 4, he begins by saying, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. Now, so obviously, let me say this. This is written to Christians. Don't go handing out the book of Colossians to an unsaved person. Um, that's not really, I would hand the Gospel of John. Yeah. Well, really, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, any of them. And then after they get that, give them Romans. Of course, that can be really deep, as we're going to find out. <laughs> but, uh, it's, but anyway, uh, Colossians is written to Christians. That's why he says he heard of their faith. They're Christians. And let me say this. The church is for Christians. The local yeah. church. So if you invite an unsaved person... Don't expect them to really absorb a lot of what we talk about. They'll hear the gospel, though, and they can be saved. But that's it. They can't move on beyond that. They can hear some things that might pique their interest, and they'll have questions. But you need to be saved. And salvation begins with faith. And not just faith. Um, I sang to Amber and Jaron and Chris... Uh, I think it was last time, last uh, Wednesday, a song. Good. We were talking about how some of the songs people sing, and there's like nothing to it. And you remember Elvis? How many of you remember Elvis? <laughs> how many of you knew the number one Elvis impersonator in Las Vegas is Greg Miller? <laughs> if wow. So, so, so. Wow. <laughs> it's not actually me, but it's his name. <laughs> his name's Greg Miller. Wow. But, you know, just because Elvis sings a song, I mean, you know, people would sing it in church if it's a gospel song. And some of the gospel songs he sang, he sang a song, that, I believe for every drop of rain a flower grows. Elvis had a better memory than I do. I almost forgot the last word there. And I was telling them, how stupid is that? If every drop of rain produced a flower, we'd suffocate. All right, <laughs> yeah, and that song is just about believing, not in the gospel, just believing. You know, I mean, you might as well sing, you know, the sound of music. The hills are alive with the sound of music. Amen. Praise the Lord. I mean, it's, there's, those songs don't mean anything. And that's what some people just believe. And you say, do you believe in God? Oh, yeah, I believe in God. Then you ask them to explain what that means. There's nothing to it. They just believe in God. Yeah. That's not the faith that we're talking about here. It's also 
Not faith in your faith. That's the word faith thing. I believe and I name it and I claim it. Mark says, I believe that my truck is going to be a big pile of gold bricks after church is over. I name it. I claim it. Wouldn't that be great? That'd be amazing. I wouldn't even bother with the offering box. <laughs> I'd just grab a hold of something. And say, ah. <laughs> also, this is another thing. How many times have you heard people boast about their faith? I, I've seen people come through some of the most horrendous things, and I believe in most of those cases that God brought them through, but when they're asked about it, they say, it was my faith that brought me through. God. Yeah, it's not your faith that brought you through. You ever think about that? Here's a bad testimony. My faith brought me through that ordeal. Well, how about saying my faith in Jesus Christ? That would be true. How about my faith in God's Word? That would be true. How about my faith in the Gospel of Jesus Christ? But if you're just saying, my faith brought me through, well, you could be a, you know, Baha faith or a Mason or a Hindu or who knows what. They all have a sort of faith. It's, it should be faith in the Lord, in His Word. I believe, I've heard this before, I believe in the power of faith. Well, how about I believe in the power of faith in God? Amen. Amen. That'd be true. I believe in the power of faith in God's Word. Or I believe in the power of faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I, I hate to be picky about that stuff, but uh, I tell some of the young men, I won't, I won't name names, of all the young men I've said this to, but I think you should be in the habit when you pray of saying in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. Just so we know you're not praying for my pizza in Buddha's name. <laughs> or Muhammad's. Or Pee Wee Herman. Or whoever. <laughs> Tell me who you're praying to. Amen? <laughs> but it also bothers me because I've been to these ecumenical prayers where they say, Oh God, the Creator of all things, the Master of the Universe. He man, you know. <laughs> you're like, no, who you praying to, man? Wow. Tell me who you praying to, amen. Give glory to who? God. Give glory to God. Amen. What's his name? Jesus. Jesus, Jesus is God. Amen. Amen. Right. Here's a little reality check. Anti-Christian critics often start their attack on Christianity by using a false definition for faith. If you don't know what faith is, you're game for being tricked or, or deceived by the atheists who will claim, they pretend that faith is something that the Bible doesn't uh, teach. They, they basically act like you just have a blind faith. You just, you know, I just believe in God. Well, why? Just cause. That's your defense of Christianity? Yep. Because. All right. Anything else? My mom was a Christian. My grandma was a Christian. Yeah. I was raised to be a Christian. Horrible reasons. Not a defense of Christianity. What if your mom was in the voodoo? Does that mean you'd be in the voodoo? You should have a reason for believing what you believe. So the question is, where does faith come from? There's your answer. The Bible says, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. See, some people have this false idea of faith, that you have faith in you, and you just choose where to put it. Where biblical faith is, no, you hear the Word of God, and if you choose to receive it as the Word of God, it produces faith in you. Amen. Amen. That's how it works. Only those who choose to believe God's Word will receive biblical faith. How many of you have heard of uh, Dennis Prager? Mm -hmm. Real good guy on politics and morality and all that. And he has chosen to believe that the Torah is the Word of God. Which is, that's good. Problem is, he's chosen not to believe the New Testament. Right. Right. And it's all a choice. And one of the great things I heard him talk about his he chose he was an atheist his grandfather was an orthodox rabbi and his grandfather gave him these sets of books and he never touched them or anything but then as he went through life and he thought about these things and really 
kind of pondered. He made a choice to believe the Torah is the word of God. And folks, I don't care. They can play their games. All these people who are atheists, agnostics, or just non-Christians, it's simply a choice. Jesus said in John 3, 19, this is the condemn, uh, condemnation, that light has come into the world, but men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Their deeds were evil. It wasn't because of some scientific basis. It wasn't because of logic and all that stuff. They loved their sin. Yeah. That's what it comes down to. Now look at this. This is how it works. 1 Thessalonians 2.13. Paul wrote this. And look what he uses in the fifth word there. Thank. <laughs> For this cause also thank we God without ceasing. Because when he received the word of God, which he heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Amen. That's the word of God. And God says that when you hear this word that I'm preaching this morning, if you will receive it as God's word, it will work in you. Amen. And if Amen. it doesn't, it's because you're looking at the Bible like any other book and you're not receiving it as the word of God. Brother John, have I seen, he's been around a few years longer than me, but both of us have seen the difference in going door to door in the 80s, we'll say, uh -huh. compared to today. Right. Yeah. In that short amount of time, you used to go door to door, and if you had a Bible, you say, you believe this is the Word of God? Well, yeah, I believe that. Yeah. And then you could go from there. These days, I don't believe that bleep. I don't believe that filth, you know. They can't even speak respectfully. They cuss and curse it. Yeah. Amen. And that's why you're not seeing door-to-door -door or any other kind of evangelism produce a lot of fruit these days because Satan has successfully won academia and entertainment and the news media for himself where they rob you of your faith in God's Word. Therefore, when it's preached, it basically bounces off their forehead. Yeah, that's right. Amen. And the Bible says if they would receive it as the word of God, it would work in them. Amen. Faith is both substance and based upon evidence, not just blindly believing. Right. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I don't just believe the Bible because someone handed me a Bible and said, This is God's word. There's more to it than that. First of all, one of the things that impresses me is its brutal honesty. I mean, the heroes. Just read about the heroes and you'll say, mm. <laughs> uh, boy, that uh, Noah getting drunk and all that stuff. Then you got Abraham and, you know, he lying to Pharaoh and lying to Abimelech because he didn't have enough faith that God was going to protect him. Yeah, that's right. Amen? Amen. And uh, Jacob, the way he did Esau, was deception. Yeah. God had told him he was going to bless him, but he couldn't leave it up to God. So yeah. he was the supplanter. <laughs> yeah. King David. Oh, yeah. Where did we get Solomon? From King David committing adultery with another man's wife and then having that man murdered. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I look at this stuff and I'm thinking, wow, if men had wrote, written this, it would be a whole lot different. <laughs> yeah. Now, that's not the only reason, but that's one of the reasons. Another is Messianic Bible prophecy. Right. Nearly 300 clear Bible prophecies about Messiah, all fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. Amen. Beyond statistical probability. Amen. It's just an amazing thing. And it's historical accuracy. I keep being told that all oh, the Bible is not historically accurate. Well, what I've learned is that they've had to constantly change that argument. They used to say Nineveh didn't exist. Then they found it. <laughs> the Hittites didn't exist. They found evidence for them. Tyre. They found in the ocean where God said it would be. Using Google Earth. Yeah. Thank God for Google. Amen. <laughs> And that's all of, and so right now they're, they're still claiming Moses was a myth. And if you go back and read that over and over, God says, this is that Moses. 
This is that Moses and Aaron. He gives his genealogy. All this information, it's like God knew that men were going to be so stupid they'd deny Moses' existence. So he's constantly reminding people, this is a real dude. He's a real guy. Really existed. <laughs> Israel, an end time prophecy. These fools who deny that Israel is a fulfillment of prophecy are not only just fools for not respecting God's word on that level, but they're actually destroying one of the great arguments in support of God's word. In this book, going back into the uh, 16th and 17th century, on into the 18th, 19th, and early 20th century, Bible believers preached that Israel was going to be revived. The Jews were going to go home. And at that time, I said, that's nutty. That's crazy. And then it happened. Amen. And 70 years ago, tomorrow, by our calendar, Israel became a nation again. Amen. Amen. Amazing. Fulfillment of prophecy and more to come with Israel. Then it's the, the effect the Bible has on believers. Anyone who rightly divides the word of truth doesn't go blowing up people and shooting people. Amen. Like they do in other religions. It changes people for the better. Drunks who became good fathers and husbands and sons. Uh, sodomites who have been saved out of that lifestyle. Adulterers who stopped committing adultery on their wives. Uh, liars and cheats and thieves who suddenly stopped being liars, cheats, and thieves. The effect has been amazing. And also it's longevity. Considering efforts to extinguish it, and if you haven't read that, we've got a couple of videos we can bring in and show you the history of the efforts, especially of the Pope and the Roman Church, to destroy the Word of God. They not only burned copies of it, for a couple hundred years, they would, if they found you with a copy, they would tie it around your neck and burn you with your Bible. And it's still the world's bestseller, etc. I mean, you think about all the things we could talk about. The fact our presidents are sworn in on Bibles. And the fact that the, the Bible is also the most hated book in the world. What's that about? <laughs> you know, on and on you could go with all that kind of thing. And then verse 4 continues and he says, and of the love which ye have to all the saints. Now, you ever ask your question, uh, you know, the Bible says we ought to love believers. We ought to love one another. Amen. Amen. But it's a good question. Why? And I just have a couple of photo montages here. and Some of the people that we've had in and out None of them are real new because I have to figure out how to get new pictures since I'm off Facebook. <laughs> but these are some of the people both locally and then I've thrown in a few pictures of people who live in other states and a couple who live in other countries that we have a relationship with. We have love one for another. And uh, you see this uh, one here. Is, you see me and Brother Sean were next to Larry and Dwayne. Dwayne went on to be with the Lord. Oh, well, I remember. Yeah, we were street preaching down there in uh, Parkersburg with them. Up here next to uh, Mariah. Look, by the way, there's Mariah and Stephen. Look at where Gloria is. That's, wow. that's hilarious if you look, actually look at that. Is. <laughs> <laughs> then right next to them is uh, um, Ron Myers. Aww. We actually have one of his songs in our songbook. I mean, we, he took the lyrics and Jenny put music to it. And here's some more. I got another one. Just uh, you might recognize some of those faces. You might recognize some of the events. You might recognize some of the things going on. And if not, we have our own memories. We have our own moments. But it's if you just sit and think about it, if without the love that God has given for us, given to us for each other, how much emptier our lives would be. Amen. What an empty space there is for people who don't have that. People who choose not to go and be involved in a local church, but also, sadly, some people who just don't have a good local church to go to. You lose a lot. So you ask the question, how can complete strangers love one another? We're told in 1 John 4, 11, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Most all of you were strangers to me at one time. How could we love one another as complete strangers? Well, God loved me, God loved you, and we're pretty strange. 
And if God can love me and you, we ought to be able to love all these other strange people. Amen? <laughs> for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. Hope. What is that? Is this, oh, I hope so. No, our hope is not in this life, but in the next, the eternal. And it's based on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's not just a hope flipping. Jesus rose from the dead. Jesus is alive. Therefore, we have hope. Um, that's why Bible believers think and talk about the rapture so much. And why the, the world likes to make fun of us about it. But I just think this is hilarious. Watch this. <laughs> Here's Washington, D.C. There's New York City. China. There's uh, London. There's Paris. Now Vegas. One guy. goes up. <laughs> Yeah, he was there to see the Grand Canyon. <laughs> you, I did. In different cities, there's a rapture, and then in Vegas, one guy goes up. Yeah, <laughs> Yeah, that was Jason. <laughs> First Corinthians 15, 19 says, If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all men most miserable. And that's what I think about these poor non-believers. They really believe this is it, and then they die, and there's nothing. That that see that in that frame, uh, in that context, to me, the only people that make sense are the drunks, and the drug addicts, and the prostitutes, and the thieves, and the liars. I mean, if this is all there is, and you just die, and that's the end of it, go for it, brother. Get all you can, man. <laughs> Amen. I know, right? As Jesus said, eat, drink, and be merry. You know. What doesn't make sense to me, and why you know there's a spiritual element to this, are all the unbelievers spending their entire lives in political activism and all this stuff when they believe, supposedly they believe it's of no use. They believe that when they die it's over, and at some point our sun's going to expand and burn up the earth and there's been no human existence at all. <laughs> That's just what doesn't make sense to me. But someday... We will have eternal day. Amen. And I believe any Christian who's right with God is going to be thinking an awful lot about that eternal day. So what produces this faith, love, and hope in us? It says in verse 5, we close. Whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. The gospel produces. By faith, we are saved. And as we said, it didn't come from just you. It came from God's word. You received God's word. You place your faith in Jesus Christ. Why? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And in His resurrection, we are provided a basis for hope. See, it's substance, evidence. And only once we are saved can we have this biblical faith, love, and hope. Let's look at one last place and we'll close. 1 Corinthians 13. And you've heard of this passage. It's read a lot at uh, weddings. And in the new versions, they replace the word charity with the word love. And that's a mistake. Amen. Because charity makes love what it really is. It's a verb. In verse 12, it says, For now we see through a glass darkly, but then, talk about after the rapture, face to face. Now in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. Huh? Now I know in part. Words. Now I know in part. That's right. <laughs> but then shall I know even as also I am known. Verse 13, And now abideth faith, hope, charity. These three. But the greatest of these is charity. We heard a song about that earlier. Amen. Let's go ahead and turn to page 16 in the praise book. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for His goodness. Words taken from Psalm 107. Jesus literally 
personified this example of love. Selfless. Giving. We read back in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who what? Loved me. And gave Himself for me. That's why Jesus is the one being praised around here. <laughs> and for all of eternity. Amen? Amen? Go ahead and stand. We'll sing.
uh, close the word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for this time with the family of God. We thank you for this song Amen. straight from your word in the Psalms. And may we be a thankful people Amen. full of faith, love, and hope, praising you now and throughout all of eternity, thanking you for your shed blood that paid for the sins of the whole world, thanking you for dying in our place and making atonement and being buried. You rose again the third day, conquering sin and death. Amen. Thank you. As you ascended, you said you would return, and we look forward to that. We see the stage being set, and we look forward to being with you, praying that you come quickly. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Fellowship with the fellers before you run out. And then have a good Mother's Day.